Hi everybody, Craig McLaren right here. And I'm going to talk to you about the difference between two very strange sounding types of uh, fossil we have in Michigan. Uh, stromatolites and stromatoporoids. The, the names are enough to scare off most people who don't know much about them. But we're going to talk about them today because they're extremely interesting. But if you don't know what you're looking at, they can also look extremely boring. It's kind of funny like that. So I'm going to show you what they both look like and we're going to begin by going into my cabinet of wonders here. And I will show you a piece of stromatolite. Doesn't look terribly interesting, does it? You might pick this up and just think it's a piece of brick or something here. You can see lots of layers in it, especially if the lighting is good, which I hope it is. If we go into my drawer here, we will find examples of stromatoporoids. There we go. Again, there's layering, but you can tell it looks quite a bit different from the other one. But again, it's just kind of weird looking. Lots of, lots of layers to it. If we turn it over, we can see it looks a bit different on this side. But again, a lot of layers to it. So, we're going to come over to the whiteboard, and first thing we're going to do is demystify these names and laugh at the way scientists try to make themselves look smarter. Firstly, we've got stromatolites. And we have the even more complex sounding stromatoporoids. Everybody knows that the longer a name is, the fancier it is. So, what does this actually mean? Well, when scientists first discovered these things in the 1800s, they did not know what they were looking at at all. They were really confused. And it's pretty obvious when you find out what these things mean. Stroma is Greek, and it means layered. And lights comes from lithos in Greek, that means rock. So the scientists back in the 1800s found these layered rocks. They're like, we don't know what they are. We don't get it. And I like to imagine a group of them sitting around thinking to themselves, we, we can't just call these things stripy layered rocks where you get laughed at. You know, one, one guy, oh, I got it. What if we call them stripy layered rocks? But in Greek, I like to picture a bunch of uh, 1800 scientists with Charles Darwin style white beards talking like, ah, oh, yes, that's going to make us sound smart. So, layered rocks. Stromatolites. And then they have these other ones that I showed you just now. And they have porous. They have these pore spaces in there. I'm like, huh, they're layered porous rock things. So you got your stroma, layered, porous. And what do we put oids on? We put on things we don't understand. Uh, in a sci fi movie, is the alien humanoid? Is it like a human? Androids, are they like humans? You know, it's so we put the word oid on we, things we don't know. So it basically in Greek literally means layered, porous, thingy. And now you know how scientists who don't have a clue what the hell they're talking about make themselves look really smart. We can't just call it a layered porous thingy, let's call it the uh, Lord. Uh, layered porous thingy in Greek, a stromatoporoid. <laughs> These are both types of fossils, and they're actually extremely interesting when you know uh, about them. Stromatolites are the oldest known living organisms on the planet. Stromatolites were covering the planet 3.6 billion years ago, and pretty much until about 600 million years ago, were the only large life forms on Earth that we know about. And very likely were the only large life forms on Earth. They are basically rock slime. 
So the way you had a stromatolite light forming is you would have a little rock here. And you would get a layer of algae slime coating it. And what happens as the waves wash against it, sand gets trapped in the slime. Researchers have looked at it and discovered that the slime, the algae, actually moves toward light. They actually did a funny uh, experiment. You can decide whether or not it was a good use of university resources, but there was a university who showed light on a stromatolite um, in the shape of their university logo and actually grew a stromatolite in the shape of the university logo. Uh, so the algae actually moves toward the light and what it does is it moves around the, the sand particles and traps them in. And so what you get is a layer of algae and then a layer of sand goes on top of that and then another layer of algae and then more sand gets trapped into it and it just keeps growing outward and outward until they get huge. Stromatolites during the Precambrian were frequently the size of a car or a bus. In fact, the largest one I myself have seen was about the length of two buses parked end to end. They were huge. Literally just rocks. The algae that built up layer by layer may sound unimportant. However, stromatolites are responsible for the great oxygenation of that. What's that? So during the early formation of the Earth, if you had shown up in a time machine, you'd be dead in moments because the atmosphere was completely toxic. Stromatolites, being algae, they take in carbon dioxide, they put out oxygen. Well, that's great for us. At the time, that was a disaster because all life uh, treated oxygen as toxic and carbon dioxide is what they breathe. Some of these great oxygenation events led to giant die-offs, mass extinction events, just wiped out the planet and produced uh, by oxidating the, the oceans, produced banded iron formation. So all the banded iron formation you find in the UP, stromatolites are responsible for dumping all that oxygen in the atmosphere that form those banded iron formations. Stromatolites were not made to last, are they? Stromatolites were the dominant form of life on our planet for over 75% of the history of our planet. Today they're almost completely extinct and they went almost completely extinct all the way back to the start of the Cambrian, as soon as complex life began to evolve. You know what's real easy to eat? Stromatolites. They have no natural defenses, and you don't have to be a complex organism to snail your way onto it and just raise on it and destroy a stromatolite. Um, you know, they were absolutely everywhere for 75% of our history. As soon as the Cambrian started, 80% of them were already extinct. Today, you find them in places like Shark Bay, a couple of uh, bays in the Caribbean, places where the water is so salty, nothing can actually get to them. Because they're easy food for fish, for sea snails, for anything in the ocean that wants to just graze and be lazy. The stromatoporoids are a little bit similar in their appearance, being layered they got the pore spaces in them. However, they're actually an extinct class of sponge. They came much later than the stromatolites. They came during the Silurian and the Devonian. Now, Devonian is important because a lot of Michigan rocks are Devonian. In fact, Rockport, where we're going to in a few days, a lot of Devonian rock is all Devonian up there. So you can actually find those stromatoporoids. And they did an interesting thing. They grew from a central point and they put out little spikes all over. And they would use these spikes as a framework to add another layer. And it was, and they would have some water in between these layers. They would think it was a sponge. And then on that next layer, they would extend those spikes. And then they would use those spikes to put another layer on. And they would just keep growing outward like that from that central point. Let me show you over here in this desk of disorganized fossils here. Here we've got one. You can see these bumps all over it. These are the lumpy outer layer that it would add onto the spikes. If we look inside, pretty interesting the way that structure is. Why is it wavy like that? I have no idea. I personally kind of think 
this stromatoporoid grew on top of some other shell or fossil of some sort. Uh, but I'm not sure. I am not a paleontologist. While we're over here, I might as well show you a few other things we can pick up at Rockport. Here's uh, get this stuff all over the place, these, these tabulate coral fossils. You also get a lot of these shells, a lot of stuff like this. Brachiopod fossils. Here's a bunch of them all stuck together. Get plenty of horn corals too. Here's a horn coral that came from there, no doubt. Pretty weathered, but I kind of like seeing the structure like that. I'm going to take you over across the science room here. Let's take a look at a real fancy one I've got here. Check this fella out. I hope the lighting is good. So you can see what it looked like on the outside. It was a sponge. It was this round spherical spongy coral. Inside you can see those radiating spikes coming out and all the hundreds, maybe thousands of layers that were built up over time in here. And you can see it is indeed porous in there. It is a layered porous thingy indeed. And if we turn it around like this, you can get a different view of it. Pretty crazy stuff. And you can find that in Rockport, where we'll be going in a few days. I like to compare, and this side is a thought I had just a day or two ago when my son threw a little ball at me. He threw this at me. This is almost exactly what a stromatoporoid would have looked like um, in the Devonian or Silurian. Maybe the color is wrong. I don't know. Maybe the color is right. Who knows? But this is pretty much exactly with these, these lumps. If you take a look at a big piece of stromatoporoid here that just shows the outside, if you look at that, it's, it's virtually the same texture. It's crazy interesting stuff. And so you find these things, and if you don't know what you're looking at, you're like, oh, huh, I found a weird lumpy rock. Or, oh, hey, what's, what's this? It's kind of stripy and layered. But in fact, it's actually these, uh, these unique fossils from extinct life forms that help shape the planet as we know it. Well, there's some other, these are all fossils that you can find in, in the Rockport area as well. There's some nice, Nice stuff here. Here's another stromatoporoid here next to some shell fossils. You can see a little bit of that layering inside. So next time you hear someone talking about stromatolites or stromatoporoids, now you know exactly what they are. They're not the terrifying sounding things they are. You know, it sounds incredibly complex, but when you understand that it's just Greek words for layered rock and uh, a porous layered thingy. Uh, it doesn't sound nearly so scary. And in the future, if you want to sound smart like an 1800 scientist, you could always just encounter something you don't know, describe it, and then give it the Greek version of that. I always enjoy when we go out west seeing the cryptobiotic soil. Always tell you don't touch. The cryptobiotic soil is so fragile. The fact is, the cryptobiotic soil, crypto is, well, that's Greek for mysterious, biotic means living. It's the, I don't know what it is, soil. So stromatolites, stromatoporoids, you can find them both in Michigan. Both are relatively rare to find. Uh, it's hard to find good stromatoporoids because the preservation on pieces like the one I got here, kind of uncommon. And stromatolites, while they were the most uh, widespread uh, organisms on Earth, uh, they pretty much went extinct about 600 million years ago. It's hard to find rocks that old. You can find them up in uh, the UP in a few places, uh, in places like Canada and Australia. You can find them in Michigan, and you can sometimes find them on the shores when you're rock hounding. And the stromatoporoids, you can find those in open pit mines. It's rare, the waves are going to wash against them. A lot of the details will be washed out. They'll be broken down pretty easily. But if you go to a place where they're coming out of the ground fresh, you can find some good ones. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. Now you know.